<laughs> um, so just give me two ticks to because I need to mute the other thing with okay. your ass in, in echoing otherwise. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we're muted already. Good. Okay. So welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum. Uh, technically, uh, officially, I should say, uh, rather than technically, our last event of the year. Although I am going home to Ireland tomorrow, so we might uh, get a live at John B. Right. session <laughs> sometime. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't been home for Christmas since 2019. So uh, we have tonight with us uh, Professor Ronald Baer, who is one of the, who is a prolific historian, but absolutely wrote the Bible on the Irish in New York, along with uh, Tim Marr and other historians, edited, uh, you know, a hugely important volume. And this is the last in our series this year. We covered the Irish and dot, dot, dot. And tonight we're looking at the relationship between the Irish and the Italian which was uh, often troubled, even though you would think on the surface of it, these people had a lot mm. in common. But in fact, um, you know, there are huge personalities involved in some of the story. And for all that they had in common, there was actually a lot of strife. So we're going to look at, you know, sort of the late 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, very, of course, turbulent time for the Italians because Italian unification only happened at the in around 1870. So, you know, what even was Italian sort of thing as they're becoming immigrants in America? But we're delighted to have you, um, Dr. Bayer. And um, I, I mean, we'll have to have you back because there's other things you can talk about than just the yeah. Irish and the Italian. <laughs> but this is very important, I think, talk for us. We we showed Brooklyn last week in our film club. And, you know, it's so interesting, like that film is, or the novel, but the film was set in the 50s and the little brother at the table says, we don't like the Irish. You know, I, I feel I should say it straight out. <laughs> So I always thought, you know, before I came to America, that the Irish and the Italian in Europe, we seem to have a lot in common. You know, we're both Catholic, both quite a rural, you know, kind of people, both very family oriented. But it's a different thing when they come to the States. So yes. uh, you can take it away and I'll ask you some questions. And, and those of you who are with us, you know, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom here on your screen to ask questions. OK, uh, if I can see it. Um, no, I, I'll moderate for you. Oh, yes. oh, okay. So you don't have to. Yeah. The Irish and Italians get along very well today. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, the, the hostility is long gone. There's a lot of intermarriage. I mean, the problems have gone. But this is the typical New York succession immigrant succession story. Uh, the Irish were here first. And, of course, they went through some terrible things happening mm -hmm. to them. So they were more reluctant to give up the power they had attained over the years in the church, in politics, in gangs, uh, and the unions and so on. So uh, when the Italians came, this new group who were quite uh, not quite understandable to the Irish in terms of what they did, uh, let's start with the church. The Irish were much more dedicated to the liturgy and the doctrine of the Catholic Church. They were much more uh, strict about that. The mm -hmm. Irish came, came with a sort of a folk religion that was Catholic, but very peasant oriented their own backgrounds with, um, festas and home hometown sinks and they had a different approach to catholicism and the irish really didn't think they were really quite catholic which is why the italians often wound up in the last pews of the church or in the basement mm -hmm. to do their their services they weren't often led into the sanctuary mm -hmm. that's what called skull gone that's uh, i think what's happened over the years is that the italian kids got got educated in the parochial schools and they got educated in the Irish style. Hmm. So, so, Ron, just to pick you up, like I know from the Irish background, most Irish Catholics, particularly in the 19th century, weren't like catechized. Yes. You know, we had had the penal laws. So there was not a formal as such Catholic religion. And as you say, it was very tied in with the folk and the pagan beliefs. My understanding, and this was just as a Catholic, not as a historian, was that, yes. you know, when we came to America, the people like Archbishop Hughes or his predecessor, who was a French Catholic, yes. you know, were very doctrinal. And yes. part of it was, you know, we have to prove that these Irish can be good American Republican citizens. And I always thought the services would be in Latin. So I never quite understood why the Italians didn't mesh like if if you go into you know St Patrick's on Mott Street in nineteen yes. or in 1895, the mass is going to be in Latin. What and the Italians weren't really welcome. Why? Why? Well, <laughs> the, well, the, the the way of of 
of dealing with, with religion was different. Uh, the Irish were not used to these big street displays other than oh, St. Yeah. Patrick. So the festas, the the uh, apple, the, the street displays, the carrying down of the of the saints down the down yeah. the street and so on. They were not used to that at all. Okay. Um, so there was some trouble there. Um, but what the Italians were pushing for eventually, which they eventually got, were ethnic parishes. They wanted Italian priests, mm -hmm. which was resist resisted at first, and so are the ethnic parishes. Mm -hmm. But quite quite a few cases in neighborhoods, so many Italians poured in that they eventually took over what were essentially Irish parishes. Yeah. So that's that part of it. The other part of what the hostility was that uh, with Italian unification, uh, and Garibaldi, Garibaldi was a big hero to the Italians, but he certainly was not to the Irish because the Pope lost his papal lands at that oh, time. Oh, yeah. So and when was, Italy reunited, they actually wanted to take over Rome too. Well, that, that was finally settled later on during Mussolini's reign, the yeah. Lateran Treaty, which, uh, which declared the Vatican, and, the Vatican an independent state okay. and paid them some money back for the lands that were taken earlier under, under the Italian unification. Oh, so, that, so that, that, the that, Irish were genuinely invested in that. You know, it's oh, funny that you would think, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah very much, very yeah. much. And that was, that was one of the early reasons the Italians and Irish didn't get along. Okay. Because that switched later on, uh, Mussolini might might have been fascist, but um, mm -hmm. he was making a treaty with the Church, with the mm -hmm. Vatican, and so the Irish were very accepting of that okay. and accepting of accepting of Mussolini, who, by mm -hmm. the way, was accepted very strongly by others who saw uh, Mussolini as a good fascist, as opposed to somebody who Hitler came along with later as the bad fascist. Yeah. So that was a distinction there too. Wow. Um, so it was okay. Then there was the neighborhoods, and that is typical New York. One mm. new group comes in. Um, Irish areas were often Irish and German, mm -hmm. and then and then the Italians and Jews came into these neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and so they displaced the other group. So um, you began to see down the Lower East Side. In fact, there was a big riot on 1882 on Mulberry Street mm. and the Lower East Side. Lower East mm -hmm. Side. So they clashed mm -hmm. uh, at that time, which again was not unusual for mm -hmm. groups to clash on the streets uh, mm -hmm. in regard to that. And then, of course, the unions. Uh, uh, Irish had made a, a, a long career of, of getting involved in union activity mm -hmm. and, and controlling these unions. And so uh, there was clashes in regard to the longshoremen, for example, mm -hmm. and, and in terms of... Um, and, and in those cases... Italians wanted to have separate locals in the unions rather than um, rather than uh, uh, share it with anybody. So, for example, in the International Lady Government Workers Union, there's an Italian local, Local 89, that was uh, run by Luigi Antonini, who happened to be a very important political figure in New York, a close ally of LaGuardia, mm -hmm. and also a, a major critic of Mussolini. Mm -hmm. So there was clashes there. A uh, big riot in Brooklyn uh, between the Irish and Italian stock workers. I mean, uh, yeah, the dock workers uh, mm -hmm. in 1894. Okay, yeah. Uh... So they clashed. Eventually, the Italians took over the Brooklyn waterfront, and the Irish kept the New York waterfront. Oh, Man Manhattan. Oh, yeah. 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 So to go back, um, just because there's so much in this history. With the neighborhoods, let's talk particularly about what used to be Five Points and then became, you know, literally uh, in the 1890s. Uh, like part of it, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon because really it's a double edged sword. I think, it, you know, Irish are doing it a little bit better for themselves. They maybe are reluctant to leave the old neighborhood, but at the same time, they can afford better and they maybe want, you know, better. So they move up to Hell's Kitchen or out, you know, to the Bronx and Long Island. Yes. I and mean, these neighborhoods are taken over by the Irish, by the Italian. I suppose they're still being served by Tammany Hall Irish politicians, you know, oh, absolutely. The main part. Yeah. And then you that? do have the the mafia, you know, we hate to say it, but La Casa Nostra is coming in from Sicily. Well, let me mention the the politics first. Oh, do the, yeah. I, the Irish controlled Tammany Hall. Yeah, and they controlled it in a way that he really didn't want to give up any power to anybody else. Okay. And the first group they responded to were the Jews, who yeah. uh, also wanted power, wanted some, and the and the Jews were a more volatile group. A lot of them were socialists at that time, 
and Tammany wanted to bring them into the democratic fold because they, uh-huh. um, the Italians, many of them were Republicans actually, uh-huh. and and Tammany wanted to bring them in too. Now, how to bring them in? Uh, if you're sharing, trying to share power with the Jews and the Italians, there's just so much power you want to give up. So uh-huh. basically, uh, what the Italians wanted were district leaderships, and they weren't getting that. And the big change comes with LaGuardia. LaGuardia is a big change agent for all of this. He brings in uh, uh, Jewish and Italians into the civil service, into government offices, uh, Mm -hmm. more Jews than Italians, but nonetheless, he brings Italians in also. And uh, that begins to open up a lot of offices. Now, also, though I hate to mention it, the mafia was involved in bringing Italians into public office as well. Uh, There was one case... Um, in one of the districts, uh, it was an Irish district leader, and one of the mafia chiefs that said it was time for him to go and get an Italian in that area, oh, and he yeah. went, and he went, and yeah. there's an Italian, yeah. So I mean, it was the, the strong arm tactics were used, pro- more likely in the 1940s. Yeah. Well, Laguardia was was even though Laguardia was a Republican, and um, mm-hmm. he was half Italian, half Jewish, but he never claimed to be Jewish particularly. Mm-hmm. But uh, his organization, the FH LaGuardia Political Club, is the one that, that got uh, Italians involved. Okay. And then there was with Vito Marcatonio, mm-hmm. who also was very important in getting Italians involved, particularly in the East Harlem area. East Harlem, did you say? Yeah, wow. Yeah, which was Italian, yeah. Italian home at that time. Yeah, yeah. Right, so yeah, the African Americans were kind of corralled in a different area, or maybe not yet. The Harlem Renaissance hadn't happened well, yet. Harlem was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Central Harlem and Northern Harlem were were more became more black. Okay. Uh, Southern Harlem was originally Jewish, and mm-hmm. East Harlem was Italian. Okay. So uh, and that eventually shifted completely now. Of course. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. 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 And just to go back a little bit on the politics, because LaGuardia is such a fascinating, I think, character. Am I right in thinking he was pro prohibition? You Who's know, this now? he was pro LaGuardia. What? Uh, prohibition, like he was breaking the, you know, the casks of beer and throwing them down the sewers. Was that him? Well, I, I would say he was pro-prohibition because he also, when he was a congressman, he set up uh, a little news uh, thing in his uh, office. He invited newsmen in and he showed them how to make it legal or legal, what was then legal, but make a beer that could oh. pass a uh, uh, can pass the inspectors right so, like yeah. a bathtub gin kind of thing yes, <laughs> yes. but i think there is a famous photo of him you know breaking into a keg and, and pouring it out on the street i didn't say that i saw him he broke up slot machines that was his big okay. thing. oh it's lot yeah yeah it's no, slot machines. so like this is all tied in with the you know the the mafia start to come from sicily in the 1890s i guess you know the black hand and the Yes. And it was very curtailed, am I right, to their own community. So they would send kind of threatening letters to a wealthy merchant, you know, or like a little store owner, basically looking for protection money. It was kind of a racket. Well, or or they used explosives and blood. They blew oh, up somebody's door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Elizabeth Street was particularly, you know, violent back. There was a... Oh, yeah, yeah. And that, of yeah. course, at that time, the Irish were the police. Were the, they were the, the police force. Yeah. And yeah. it was very important. Uh, and uh, it was an important power structure to them. So um, when the Italians came into these areas, yeah. the Irish really didn't know how to deal with them. Yeah. Finally, in 1906, the New York Police Department created an Italian squad. Okay. Made up of about five, five or six Italians, and they would patrol the Italian areas. Wow. Because uh, the Italians felt that the Irish police were not fair to them. It's very, very yeah. uh, uh, comparison to the how minorities feel about police today. They felt the police were not fair to them. They they arrested, uh, in that case, Italians rather than the Irish during yeah. the uh, during this big fight on Mulberry Street. Uh, as I remember, the uh, police arrested about six Italians, no Irish. Wow! Yeah, so that was that yeah. was a thorn a thorn yeah. in their side. Yeah, yeah, and like there's obviously a period of time where the Irish hold on the gangs, you know, we, we talked about before in other lectures, the, the gangs of New York, you know, and, and how a lot of those were Irish and Catholic and of course, nativist and Protestant. But then this is evolving. So by the very late, like 1890s, 
Yes. There's only like the Irish have only barely got a toehold in that because they've moved on to now Hell's Kitchen and other districts. Yeah. And so old Irish established gangs or territories maybe would be a better you know descriptor are being taken over by Italian gangs. So you were saying that Al Capone got his start in New York, technically in, in an Italian gang, but the guy had taken a, an Irish name. Yeah, in Brooklyn particularly, he got a start. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the days of the Dead Rabbits and the Wyos, who which were Irish gangs back then, they made that movie Gangs of New York. They were the big gangs back in the 1830s and 40s. When we get into the Italian era, those yeah. gangs begin to fade or they're taken over. So uh, the gangs became mainly Italian, and then yeah. the Italian gangs joined with the Jewish gangs, basically to okay. finish the finish the wiping out of the Irish gangs. Yeah, and the, like those gangs, we'll talk about the unions in a minute. <laughs> but those gangs were just pure lawlessness; like it was thieving and robbery and oh, absolutely, you know, yeah, absolutely. yeah, violence yeah. for violence's sake. Yeah, U union union crime. They would hire yeah. themselves out to the workers to uh, protect them against the uh, bosses and they would hire them to the bosses to beat up the workers. Okay. So they got so then when we get to the union, and it is interesting, like, you know, Irish didn't necessarily work in factories as, as much as Jewish or Italian for sure. So, you know, we, we know that strike, like coming up to the, the Triangle Factory fire, for instance, like very few Irish girls were working, if any, you know, we're working in, in the Triangle Factory, but the Irish cops were beating the sugar out of those girls, you know, the winter before. Yeah, and so yeah. when it comes to things like the waterfront and the union, um, so let, let's take, you know, the book that the Marlon Brando film, you know, sort of is based on. What's the tension there between Irish and Italian? Are they, they're both workers and um union breakers or, you know, what's the dynamic there? Okay, first of all, even though the Irish were making it in New York, there was plenty of them that were unskilled. Yeah. There was still a lot of poor Irish in New York at that time. And so, and of course, a lot of poor Italians, and they were conflicting over who gets jobs on, on, the, on the docks. And the docks were often controlled by gangs or by gang yeah. leaders. So that, that was a problem there. The unions weren't always beneficial to the workers because they also were, tended to be controlled by various other elements. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases by the 1930s, by communist elements in some of the unions, or just corrupt, corrupt unions. Yeah, so they yeah. fought it out. They fought it out in the docks in terms of who's going to control, who's going to get the jobs every day. Because you know, longshoremen appear every day, and they get they get jobs handed out to them by the boss mm -hmm. or the, the dock boss. So who's going to get those jobs? Are very important. That was their that was their daily bread. Hmm. And I like who won that in the end, <laughs> or did anybody win? The Italians won in the uh, in Brooklyn and, and the Irish won in New York. Oh, right. So they divided up the territory. How does the worker fare in all of this? <laughs> I don't think the worker fared very well. They did. Yeah. Uh, the longshoremen in unions were always corrupt for a long time. Okay. Some of the some of the big mafiosos were were controlling the unions by the 1940s, and uh, they did better in the uh, garment industry. Yes, which the was Irish, probably Jewish. Yeah, it was more Italian. Jewish. Yeah. Yeah, it was it wasn't Irish, yeah. 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 Wow. Well, that's kind of a throw a punch. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is typical New York stuff. This is typical yeah, yeah. Ethics, and this continues on. It's not just New York, like Hoffa, you know, maybe. Oh, sure. Or, oh, oh yeah. sure. Other cities as well. Other yeah. cities. I, I I wrote about New York. That was the thing I know the best. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, absolutely, other cities as well. Right. Yeah. And so, like, that's always amazing to me. That you know, you think union, like, and and worker organizations are so you know i would say idealistic and and civic minded and progressive you know and yet there is this tainted you know sort of corrupt element to it that isn't for either the corporation or the worker it's just out for themselves you know right of course they were making yeah. money they were yeah. stealing the pension pension funds they yeah they were making a lot of money out of the unions yeah. a lot of a lot of them were corrupt teams this union very corrupt, you know, during that time. Yeah, that that's, you know, kind of incredible, really. Um, So to go back, when you talked to us a little bit about Al Capone, you were saying he started in, technically it was an Italian gang, but the Italian guy had taken an Irish name and then he moves, of course, very quickly. I yeah, suppose, he, he started, he started the, as I said, he was married to an Irish woman, which was not that usual oh. at that time. Yeah. Uh, but he eventually moved to his, his boss, Johnny Torrio, eventually moved to Chicago and he brought Capone along with him to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Torrio dropped out of the business. Mm 
because there was an assassination attempt on him and he decided to time to leave. And so yeah. Capone took o- Capone took over the the mob in Chicago, which also involved a lot of Irish people as well, because yeah. uh, Chicago was, a, was an Irish town as well. Yeah. So you had the same thing sort of happening there. Yeah. And Frank Kelly, was that what t- the guy was going under or was that a different fellow? This Frank uh, Kelly guy who was actually Italian. Frank Kelly, I believe his original name was Vaccarelli. He was oh, Italian. He was okay. Italian. Yeah. But it was, it, was, it was very common actually for uh, Italian gangsters at that time to take Irish names. Yeah. And, and it was also interesting enough in sports and boxing, it was very uh, common mm-hmm. for uh, non-Irish boxes take Irish names. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, and it lasts for so long. You know, they seem to definitely the Irish. I suppose they were involved on the floor. You know, of so many of the like prize fighting and labor and the unions and you know the police, even you yeah. know, the nationalization of the firemen. You know that it might have suited people. So that that's where we come back to Laguardia. Like it's such an interesting career trajectory he has because he actually worked on Ellis Island, I believe, as a translator. You know, watching these immigrants come in. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, and and he must have. It, it like it's interesting to me that he, you know, his own people were probably immigrants, and so, you know, the little flower. Did he speak Italian? I I don't know if he did actually. I think if I think he did. He did. Yeah, okay. Think, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think he did. but but you remember they were preying on their own people. Yeah. As were the, as were the Irish gangs. I mean the uh, uh, the Italian uh, gangsters. Like the Jewish gangsters, like the Irish gangsters, preyed yeah. on their own people. Yeah. I used to work for the Big Onion walking tour when I worked at Fordham. And we would, you know, do, as it was, five points and then became Little Italy and is now Chinatown. And, you know, we had the site of the first ever bomb threat, you know, from the yeah. Casa Nostra. And, and it was so interesting that, you know, the and as you said, too, the, the festivals, so San Gennaro. You know, the church is oh. right around the corner and such a huge Italian festival and must have appalled the Irish in one way because you would never march through the, the streets, you know, carrying a, a statue and, and, you know, the mafia taking all the money at the end of the day. You and, putting, know. And, putting, yeah. and putting money into the statue. Yeah. Uh, very. It's, it's, I've been there a number of times, St. Gennaro. It's a very good festival. Yeah. But it was not what the Irish were used to. Yeah, seeing. absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. And so, and you know, you had this, as you say, not just in Italy, the Madonna of 125th Street is a really yeah. good little book, you know, if anybody's interested in how a parish kind of negotiates, you know, and again, I was always shocked because mass was in Latin, but it was more than just the mass. It was the parish and it the, was the parish, it was, it was, the parish it was are a, doing. It was the yeah. priest and how the priest reacted to the congregation. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, well, the ethnic parishes eventually came to be. Yeah. I mean that was that was a very tough decision for the Catholic Church to make sure yeah. that And that really lasts run like into the 20th century. You know, people identify themselves by their parish. Yes, of you course. Know, in many to Chicago and Boston too, you know. Which yeah. is why when you when you see neighbor succession, let's say in 1950s, 60s, the Irish and Italians were the last ones to leave the neighborhood. Wow. And because they didn't want to leave their parish, and they're the ones who fought back the strongest. Yeah. Of, Look at Boston, for example, you see that particularly. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and particularly, like, that's all even more complicated than with the issues like segregation and busing and all of those, you know, because so the Italians, you know, LaGuardia is coming to power in the early 1920s, I think, you know, the small kind of scale. Yeah. We have, of course, of Al Smith fails miserably to become president, but the Johnson Reed Act is passed. And yes. this attempts to limit the amount of people who can come in based on a proportion of how many is already in. And this we, does not go well for the Italians. You know, it's, it's great for the Irish because we are already in by our millions. Well, you're Northern Europeans, of course. Yeah. But yeah, it yeah. was very hard for Southern Italians. They were yeah. really hit hard by that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, and was and what was, yeah. like, what was the general feeling uh, among Americans or among the powers that be, like, why were Italians not welcomed as much as other Europeans? Well, uh, you're hearing some of the rhetoric today, unfortunately. I know, yeah. The, the newer immigrants were considered to be poisoning the blood of America, yeah. to be inferior, to uh, ruin the genetic makeup of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole replacement theory you hear today yeah. really begins in the 1920s with uh, a book called The Passing of the Great Race. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of interest in uh, in the future of the country and how, the, how can the future of the country be 
be stable, a democratic, with all these peasants and other people who don't know anything about democracy and uh, will just sell their votes, whatever they want them to say about them at that time. So, yeah. yes, it's the same yeah. sort of theory you have today. Yeah. And what's so interesting about that book, I, I talked about that in my own dissertation. You know, the Irish are included in that, even though by then they're in such huge numbers in America, but they're already, you know, some of the it, it's Madison Grant writes it and he, you know, they're into phrenology, they're into all this kind of fake, you know, science. And he he classified the Irish as sometimes a Mediterranean people, but sometimes a Celtic people and, and that they were too clannish and too emotional, like the Italian. Well, just you like know. the Al, Al Smith election in 1928. Yeah. Yeah. He was faced with burning forces in a lot of places he campaigned in the South. An yeah. Irish Catholic from New York running for president? Yeah. No, yeah. No, that wasn't going to happen. He couldn't possibly be good, a good American, you know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, that's the one thing as an immigration historian, we see that loop all the time. You know, it's a all hundred years later, but yeah, yeah. It's a never-ending story. It really no. is. And so then... You know, Ron, in the does it start to for the Irish and the Italian, does it start to get a little bit more friendly kind of in the 1950s or yes. when did they start intermarrying kind of in I these think, numbers? I think after World War II, you see uh yeah. more intermarriage. First of all, you had the army, which was a very important assimilation yeah. aspect to it. Uh they were mixed with people from all over the country, so there wasn't uh, uh you didn't have the Irish brigade like you had in World War One. Yeah. Uh and so you had that. And I think I really do think because of the parochial schools where the Irish and uh, Italian kids met yeah. and got to know each other and the Italian kids were assimilated into the Irish way of of um, religion. Mm -hmm. I think that's when you can see the intermarriages rate mm -hmm. rise, mm -hmm. which is which is considerable. I think basically if the Irish or Italian were marrying out, they were marrying into the Irish or the or yeah. Into the, you know. yeah. And, but it was still called sort of a mixed marriage. Like, you know, I hear anecdotally all the time in Albany, even my, when my parents married, my grandmother stopped talking to her son. Or, you know, <laughs> like there, there was still kind of in the 50s or 60s, a little bit of, you know, kind of schadenfreude around the, the intermarriage, you know. Well, I mean, those, that, I mean, if, if Italian married somebody from a different village, that was considered to be no, not good initially. Yeah. And, and there was the same thing happening with the German Jews and the Eastern European Jews. Yeah. Who didn't like to be intermarried. So yeah. it was, again, very common. And so the book that most of this talk is based on neighbors in conflict, obviously you're looking at New York, but you do look at the, the Jewish community as well. And is do you include Germans separately? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, I, I look at Irish and Germans in my work. And of course the Germans are such a huge group, you know, and, and there's a third Catholic, a third Protestant, a third Jewish, you know, some of them are rich, some of them are not rich. <laughs> they seem to be very more like disparate, whereas like, you know, the Jewish community sort of stick together, the Irish sort of stick together yeah. and the Italians stick together. It, it's harder to, you know, see how you can melt those barriers in a city like New York, but well, yeah, I, you kind of have to. Well, the Germans, of course, Southern Germans were from were Catholic, yeah. and Northern Germans were Protestant, but they came over with more money anyway. Yeah, they they were richer. They didn't fall into the same trap as the Irish in terms yeah. of being this poverty stricken group. So they they did better, yeah. and you, and as you said, they were so no, so numerous around the country yeah. that uh, they didn't worry about these little fights. Uh, there were German gangs, but they dissipated pretty fast. Yeah. And by the time you get to the nineteen thirties. Um, the Nazi issue was somewhat, but it didn't attract a lot of Germans, uh, yeah. German Americans to that at all. Well, we did have that Bund meeting. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Bund was mostly made up of newly arrived Germans, though Germans yeah. who came after World War One. Okay, yeah, yeah. So there's this huge meeting. Was it 1939 or 38 in Madison Square Garden? And I then, the, or maybe later, because I think Pearl Harbor happens. Yeah, no, it was 38, 39. I think, I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 38, 39. Now, where the various groups did, did get together, um, the Irish were isolationists because they did not, did not want to fight for England again. Yeah, true. As mm -hmm. you might imagine. And the Italians would tend to be isolationists already, also because they didn't want to fight against Italy. Okay. And they, and, and they liked Mussolini. So that all stopped Pearl Harbor. That was gone. Yeah. But, uh, but that initially, they drew together on the isolationist point of view. Yeah, yeah. Which had been difficult, too, you know, in World War One, like the Irish and the Germans had already kind of gone through that you know, will we, won't we, you know, should we, shouldn't we kind of thing, but yeah. And, I think and it's I think one of the reasons why you, why you have fewer German interests by the 1930s. They had been 
so terribly maligned in World War One. Yeah. That they didn't want to identify with being German that yeah. much. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. A lot of name changes. And yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think you know, I I say this about the Irish all the time too. It it looks like after World War Two, you know, between the GI Bill and everything that happens, there's kind of this moment for about twenty years or maybe thirty years in American history where you're just American. Like if you had been in, you know, there was no kind of call to ethnicity. There was no, you know, you were just working class or middle class American, and and people seemed to have been kind of happy with that, you know. Yeah, I think I think you. Um... Yeah, during the fifties was sort of you were you were yeah. an American, but yeah. there were still some issues. Right, uh, Irish and blacks in, in South Boston, for example, yeah. Yeah. there were still issues that. And I, I I wrote an article about this uh, at one point about how ethnic um, preferences still continue. Yeah, even yeah. with Irish Italian families, there's still one culture that tends to dominate, yeah. and there's still differences in child rearing and things like that in yeah. terms of of these marriages. Yeah. So well, and I would imagine too, not that I know, but you know, anecdotally I'm thinking in terms of religion, I'm sure the Catholics sort of win out, unless maybe you're, you know, super Jewish and it's through the matrilineal line. But yeah. I, I would imagine in a mixed marriage, a lot of the time the Catholic would, you know, they're going to follow the Catholic religion, even if the father is Protestant or the mother is Protestant, you know, yeah. 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 And the funny they were Irish Protestants, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, plenty of Italian Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true, yeah. yeah no, you know, they're, they're, they're actually more, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I would say the move to the suburbs, getting out yeah. of these these tight ethnic neighborhoods, getting yeah. into a suburban environment where there's everybody, yeah. I think that began to break down these, these yeah. ethnic times, too. And I think, Ron, too, you know, 1965, like the, the gee, I can't even remember what it's called, that Immigration Act, you know, you're yeah. not refreshing yourself from Europe anymore. No, and that has no. to have an impact on the fact that now you're talking like the immigrant is second or third, you know, generation back. And so, you know, there isn't this refreshing from the motherland, you know, in terms of Italy or Ireland. No, no. In fact, in fact, uh, after the 65 Act, there were so few Irish coming in that Senator Ted Kennedy yeah. uh, passed a measure to uh, increase Irish immigration to the United States. Yeah. But it was coming from elsewhere. Uh, other people wanted to come to the country to do the same thing that the Europeans had done, yeah. make it in America, have a good life and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always fascinating to me, like that the, the opportunity we afford to our own with the benefit of hindsight, you know, so when you look at Irish immigrants coming in during the great hunger, for instance, you know, yeah. some of them are incredibly poor. They may have been Irish speaking. They were certainly not educated. A lot of them, you know, those are the people fleeing Guatemala today. Like they're they're oh, coming with as little, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. These are these are the typical immigrants, poor yeah. looking refugee for a better, almost better status. Yeah. What's that? yeah. Yeah. It's refugee status almost. You know, yeah. Same same, same thing. Yeah. As Amer Americans forget. Yeah. That, absolutely. Uh, uh, that their own people came over yeah. here relatively poor, uh, yeah. and and were here to make it in America, to start a yeah. new life. And in one way, like the Italians maybe even had it harder to come in because 1892, it's federally regulated. You've got to go through Ellis Island. Like, I'm, you know, I'm sure Irish people rocked up like in 1870, you know, and you didn't have to really pass anything. You know, I mean, you had to prove you couldn't be a burden on the state, but you could probably falsify papers pretty quickly to say well, that you're here for five the Germans, years. Irish Germans passed through Castle Garden. Yeah, and that was that was state control, not federal control. Yeah, and it was relatively, relatively, uh, relatively easy to get easy. through. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so even with the Italians, you know, as you said, a lot of them are changing their name. Or, and I will say too, we didn't talk about this earlier on. You know, some of the Italians were highly skilled, like those marble workers, and you oh, know, sure. so they're sure. coming in on much higher wages, for instance, than Irish laborers. Oh, sure, you know, in the early nineteen hundreds, or or that way. So, you know, a lot of the, like the Empire State Building and the Christ oh. Building and all this was built by, you know. Oh, they, they were terrific basins. I should yeah. also mention that Italians, when they came, were often uh, sojourners, is that they oh, came yeah. here, made some money, and went back. Yeah. And what stopped that and what stopped Italian immigration to the United States was World War One. Yeah. And once that, that World War One came, the Italians began to organize politically because then that now they were here. Yeah, they had to stay. That, I forgot about that. There was a massive repatriation rate until then. Maybe oh, 50% yeah. went home. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
or they would go they... home for the winter and marry in Italy and you know have a baby every year in Italy. <laughs> you know, buy some land, buy yeah. some land. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was very important because they weren't involved politically. They weren't becoming citizens yeah. because they plan they didn't plan to stay. Yeah. Now the Irish plan to stay. Yeah. A and the Jews plan to stay. Yeah. So the Italians were a little more flexible on that. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that they even had the wherewithal to go back like in the winter. So their jobs must have been sort of seasonal here, that they had the flexibility to go home. Yeah, yeah that probably was, was, was the case. Yeah. yeah. But the main thing was to was to go home, buy some land and become somebody important in, in yeah. Italy. Yeah. They weren't yet committed to the United States. And I read, I can't remember in what book it was, but they were saying one of the things, the differences in the church too was that, you know, it might have been that book about food or maybe the Madonna of 125th. But they were saying, you know, the Irish identified politically with the priest as like a victim of British oppression you yes. know, and all of this kind of jazz. Whereas the Italians saw the priest as almost a member of the landlord class. Well, so the, there wasn't the that Italian, identity, you know. The yeah. Italians were much, much more anti-clerical. There was no question yeah. about it. The priest yeah. was not a re revered figure in the town. He yeah. was seen as as um, uh, an appendage of the ruling class. Yeah. So, so the Irish the priest was an extremely important person and a revered person in the community. Yeah, definitely an authoritative, I think. And it was the same with food. You know, Hasse Diner says in her book, Hungering for America, that Italians were, you know, delighted kind of and amazed with how plentiful food in America was for them. And so like in our, you know, initially you maybe only ate meat once a week, whereas you could have it here three or four times a week. But for the Irish food had always been such a scarcity that they don't yes. make anything of it, you know, in America. And they continue to buy, you know, if the Jewish butcher only sells corned beef, then we'll eat corned beef. We won't eat bacon. You know, food doesn't become a thing the way Italian American food, you know, becomes. Well, look at look at pizza. It's an American right. food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As is corned beef. <laughs> corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> But yeah, so does anybody have any questions? I'm going to just quickly look on YouTube. Um, uh, does If you have a question, just go down here in the Q&A and um, type it or I, and I can field it. But, you know, it, it's such a fascinating story because it, it it's amazing to me as a, you know, a fellow European, I will say, yeah. how long it took for them to become friendly here in the States, you know. But as you said, it's kind of a scarcity of resources, the Irish are very reluctant to give up a hard fought, you know, place. Um, and, and they're often, because they're that little bit ahead of them, you know, they're the police when the, the Italians are the criminals or right, you know, and so well, they, they were in competition. Effort. They were in competition yeah. with each other. And that was the whole that was every ethnic group was a competition to the one that came before. Yeah. So that was, yeah. Um, Jeffrey says, Thank you. Great program. Thanks, Jeffrey. I'm delighted you're on tonight. Um I don't know. We have a good few people on, so I'll just wait, you know, in case it's taking them time to type. Um, Kevin or somebody is telling me have a safe trip home. I'm I'm going home tomorrow to Ireland for Christmas. So uh, our own members know that I have yet to pack, of course, and I have to fill my dishwasher and empty <laughs> <the tin. laughs> but no panic. Um and I know we're going to be back in January. We've got Dr. Tim Marr with his yeah. new book, Becoming Irish American, I think. And we have a reading in the museum on, don't quote me, I'll send out the newsletter, but maybe the 14th of January, we're going to do a reading from Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, because there's a, a dinner oh. theme that we want to uh, connect with. So, um, but this has been absolutely fascinating, Dr. Bear. You know, I've wanted to talk to you for the longest time, so I'm absolutely thrilled. We have your book in, actually, we have the one book in the museum, but I must get the others, because this Neighbours in Conflict book is, um, I, I think, very interesting for our members, because... Of course, most of them are Irish American, but a lot of them in Albany are mixed, either Italian and or German, you know, sure. and Irish. Sure. So um, and I have to say with what's going on, as you say, with the new, you know, kind of groups of immigrants coming in and of course, what's going on internationally, it's important to know, you know, our own kind of roots here in the States and, and how sometimes the pendulum swings, you know, from one group to another or you know, what, what acceptance sort of is, you know. But I'm very sympathetic that the immigrants coming in today. I, I don't see any mm. real shift in historical immigration to this country, yeah. except where they're from, where they're coming from. That's the yeah. only thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Everything that is being said about people today was said in the 1850s, you know, about the Irish in the 1880s, about the Italian. And look at, you know, if we can allow that the Irish made it, you know, this, this clannish, pugnacious, pagan Irish Catholic, 
you know, if, if we can be accepted and rehabilitated in an American image, you know, then why can't they not, you know, Christine? I'm sure if you happens. have somebody, if you have somebody in the 1840s, would the Irish ever be uh, good Americans? Or can yeah. an Irish person ever become president? It would yeah. have been, oh, that's ridiculous. So, yeah, you know, I, I, it's different, yeah. different at a few points given on, on where you are in history. Yeah. Well, and as you said, Al Smith, you know, the, the anti-Al Smith campaign in 1928 was so horrific, you know, that it's impossible to think it was not even 100 years ago, you know, yeah. and here we are. And, you know, I was going to say something about the politics of the thing, you know, and just what you you think and other capable. Oh, I know. I, I was involved with um the German Historical Institute. Um, I would say 10, maybe more years ago, we went to Washington and they got involved with an Asian American kind of think tank and we presented it in the Senate and their research shows that every, you know, lifetime of this immigration cycle, it is the immigrant class who are the entrepreneurs. Yes. So, you know, whether it's Chinese people or Italians or today, you know, Latin Americans, they will open a store. And if it fails after a year, they'll open a restaurant. And if that fails, they'll open something else. And, you know, their their family work in this, their neighbors, they never become a burden on the state because they're actually entrepreneurial, you know. Yes. And oh. we know that most immigrants are not actually entitled, you know, to any welfare, no matter what you might no, hear in the rhetoric, you know, there, there is no welfare for immigrants, you know, so. But but the, uh, actually, the immigrant generation was very entrepreneurial yeah. and 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 usually had a lower crime rate than the Native Americans. It was the yeah. second generation that was sort of the caught between co two cultures. They yeah. they weren't this, they weren't that, and they had trouble finding jobs and so on. That's where you get the gangs from. Yeah, yeah. In every iteration, isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, by the I, way, mm -hmm, I want to you. mention also I have a book about Ellis Island that people might be interested in also. And Ellis Island was taking in up to 10,000 people a day, wow. which is very instructive to what we can do now yeah. um, at the board if we, if yeah. we want this. And they closed that in, was it 33 or? <sighs> well, it it, uh, it was actually open until 54, oh, but yeah. it wasn't really used as an immigration center after those main laws were passed. Yeah. During World during World War Two, we we housed some um, suspect German and Italian uh, individuals there. Yeah, yeah, an internment almost camp. Yeah. And, yeah, basically, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's interesting because the Feds took over whatever was the precursor to Homeland Security. They, you know, it's where you land. You don't need a center in New York. It's, I mean, for me, it's done at the airport now, right? <laughs> you know, like, okay. or I have to go to the American Embassy in Ireland you know, to yeah. get my visa. So you can't even come to America, actually, right? As an immigrant, you know, you have to no, get, no, you get your approved. visa before. Yeah, yeah. You get your exam before. Yeah. yeah. You don't really, there's no, there's no else on anymore because that's all done overseas for the most part. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I will say, I think out of all of the issues, you know, and I've been living in America since 2009, and, and there's a lot of issues that we're not often informed on, or, you know, if you're only consuming one type of media, you're getting only one side of the story. I, I think an awful lot of Americans do not understand how immigration to their own country works. Oh, no, you know? not at all. Yeah, yeah. I also, you took the, you're a citizen now, of course, right? So not you yet. Took... No, I just oh, got oh. my green card last year. Well, so my green card, which should have taken nine months, took five years. Of course, yeah. <laughs> That's what, one of the things wrong, but but uh, if you take the citizenship test, most Native Americans could not pass the citizenship yeah. test that immigrants take. Yeah, which is probably a high school civics class worth right. of <laughs> it is basically. Yeah. But they it still is. won't. And it's what is it? A hundred questions? Something. Yes, yeah, hundred questions. Yeah. And yeah. you can only fail. So you know, like you, you have to get ninety percent correct or more. You know, it's it's not like a fifty fifty. It's a very strict test. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've seen it, and I. I've showed it to some of my classes and they had trouble passing it. So yes, it's, yeah. a good, it's a good exam. You know, I wish that that is one of the things that, you know, this is not a political football, really shouldn't be, you know, considering we we're all immigrants. You know, if you came in 1665, you know, we we're immigrants. Uh, Jeffrey says he's very much enjoying the conversation. It's amazing how little of this history seems to be generally known, but yet how important it has been in American of history. Course. From the well, days my, own, my own grandparents were immigrants. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, man. You know, how, I'm pretty recent too, really. Yeah, yeah. You probably grew up hearing another language in the home, you know, through your grandparents. 
my grandparents. Yeah, they, did they, they speak another language? They spoke Yiddish. Yeah, yeah, imagine. Yeah. Uh, he says, from the days of the Know Nothings and their transition into the Republican Party as the Whigs failed through management of the Democratic Party by the old line politicals as the Irish rose into power. Most Americans today are clueless about all this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, and it is, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we, you know, we sometimes we struggle with this as a museum because I, particularly as an immigrant too, you know, with the accent, I'm fearful sometimes of delving into what I would see as politics, you know. But for me, it, everyone should know this already. Like, this should not be something that can be trotted out during an election year, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. Yeah. It yeah. Really so we look forward to next year. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I now that I have a green card, I feel a little bit safer. But at the same time, you know, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, on that cheery note... Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Beer. This was absolutely brilliant. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a long time and we'll definitely have you back. I'm, I am going to get your Ellis Island book because I think our members would love that. So I'll order that for the museum and we should have it in the new year. Uh, as I say, we're back in January with Dr. Tim Marr, uh, yes. your co-editor. Uh, I think that's yeah. early January. It might be the 8th or 9th, but I'll put this up on Facebook and the website soon. And then definitely we're doing the portrait of the artist in-house uh, so that we yeah, might get to the well, I'll be, I'll be willing to come back anytime. Just let me know. I would love to have you. Yeah. Virginia said, thank you. Lots to think about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank Here's you. Too. Virginia. So thank you very much. Happy holidays to everybody. And um, I will be in touch with you. Okay. Thank, thank you.